<laughs> Hello there. Welcome to our Digital Experience Center. As you know, we love putting you first in everything we do. We've got the ATMs, so you don't have to walk into any banking hall. And if you want to deposit, you can too with the Telecash Recycler. We have a self-service kiosk available for your personal banking services like your statement request, card block, pin reset, and other requests. The self-service kiosk offers these various services for all your banking queries and needs. There is the card issuance machine for your new ATM card on the go with no hassles. For our trendy customers, we've got video banking available with ease you can sit and carry out all your banking needs. First Bank Digital Experience Center is innovative, automated and interactive. It's your one-stop banking solution to a fully digital banking experience. Step in and enjoy a world of possibilities. You first, first bank. Emergencies happen when you least expect them to. It gets worse when you are cash trapped. No need to despair. First Advance has you covered. You can get that urgent cash right now on First Advance. With First Advance, salary earners can get up to 50% of their salary. No hassles. As long as you earn a monthly salary and your salary account has been active for at least two months, just dial star 894 star 11 hash or simply dial star 894 hash on your mobile phone. What's more, when you open a First Bank salary account, you can enjoy zero charges and free debit card issuance. Download the First Mobile app on Play Store or App Store today. Log in to experience First Bank digital banking. Select Loans, select First Advance and follow the prompts to receive your loan. Don't let that urgent need get the best of you. Get First Advance now. It's as simple as dialing star 894 star 11 hash. First Advance. Fast, convenient, secure. You first. First Bank. Here's a card when no go give you stress at all. Zero weight and zero cues. Here's a card when no go give you a hala. Zero trouble now for you. Tell off it's if I'm tell off it's spoiler. Who won't break them? Where you want to see them? Now only you get them. Not if you do one. Shop, shop, payment. Swipe the code, you know the way. Veteran card, you wear the sweet body. Veteran card, we know the shape messy. We put you first again. First banking, veteran card, we put you first again. Generate your virtual card, we put you first again. First banking, virtual card, we put you first again. Just generate your virtual card. Yeah. home was a smell, it would be the scent of home-cooked meals. If home was a sound, it would be lively tunes of Afrobeat at a party. 
If home was a season, it would be the dry and chilly winds of Hamatan. If home was an emotion, it would be the vigor and perseverance of Niger. If home was a place, it would be the people I hold close to my heart. Which is why I am never far from home when I transact with First Diaspora. Even if you can't be near your friends and family, you can feel at home every time you transact with First Diaspora. Open a First Diaspora account and you'll always be home, even abroad. Welcome home. Visit www.firstbanknigeria.com. You first, First Bank. The finest things of life haven't been so convenient. Whether you are shopping or on a business trip, you are covered by a credit card that gives you more flexibility and convenience to save a life at full crush. You can use the First Bank Visa Gold Card in over 29 million locations and make withdrawals in over 1.8 million ATMs worldwide. Backed by Visa Global Guarantee and Security. Check. Secured by Chip and Pin Technology. Check. Accepted worldwide. Check. Available for use within 24 hours with instant PIN selection at all First Bank ATMs. Check. Emergency card replacement. Check. Emergency cash advance. Check. Access to select global visa privileges and benefits, discounts and rewards at Choice Hospitality Centers worldwide. Check. Valid for up to three years. Check. Cat control with cat services on First Mobile. Check. Don't make your next trip without a First Bank Visa Gold credit card. Walk into any First Bank branch to get the credit card that lets you do more today. You first. First Bank. It's time for First Bank's win big promo. 170 million Naira up for grabs. Open or reactivate your First Bank account. Deposit and maintain a minimum of 5,000 Naira for just 30 days. And the soft life begins. Transact up to five times on our digital channels. And guess what? You could be a lucky 100,000 Naira winner each month. But wait, there's more. Deposit and maintain 50,000 Naira each month for four months or deposit 200,000 Naira for four months and you could stand a chance to win a whooping one million Naira in the grand finale. Don't miss your chance to win big with First Bank. This promo runs till February 23rd, 2024 and is open to new and existing account holders. Terms and conditions apply. Keep transacting. Keep winning. You first. First Bank. <laughs> Hello there! Welcome to our Digital Experience Center. As you know, we love putting you first in everything we do. We've got the ATMs, so you don't have to walk into any banking hall. And if you want to deposit, you can too with the Telecash Recycler. We have a self-service kiosk available for your personal banking services like your statement request, card block, pin reset and other requests. The self-service kiosk offers these various services for all your banking queries and needs. There is the card issuance machine for your new ATM card on the go with no hassles. For our trendy customers, we've got video banking available with ease you can sit and carry out all your banking needs. First Bank Digital Experience Center is innovative, automated and interactive. It's your one-stop banking solution to a fully digital banking experience. Step in and enjoy a world of possibilities. You first, First Bank. Emergencies happen when you least expect them to. It gets worse when you are cash trapped. No need to despair. First Advance has you covered. You can get that urgent cash right now on First Advance. With First Advance, salary earners can get up to 50% of their salary. No hassles. As long as you earn a monthly salary and your salary account has been active for at least two months, 
Just dial star 894 star 11 hash or simply dial star 894 hash on your mobile phone. What's more, when you open a First Bank salary account, you can enjoy zero charges and free debit card issuance. Download the First Mobile app on Play Store or App Store today. Log in to experience First Bank digital banking. Select Loans, select First Advance and follow the prompts to receive your loan. Don't let that urgent need get the best of you. Get First Advance now. It's as simple as dialing star 894 star 11 hash. First Advance. Fast, convenient, secure. You first. First Bank. Here's a card when no go give you stress at all. Zero weight and zero cue. Here's a card when no go give you a hala. Zero trouble now for you. Tell off it's if I'm tell off it's spoiler. Who won't break them? Where you won't say I'm now only you get them. Not if you do one. Shop shop payment. They go, you know the way. Veteran card, you wear the sweet body. Veteran card, we know the shape messy. We put you first again. First bank, you veteran card, we put you first again. Generate your virtual card, we put you first again. First bank, you veteran card, we put you first again. Just generate your virtual card. a smell it would be the scent of home cooked meals if home was a sound it would be lively tunes of afro beats at a party if home was a season it would be the dry and chilly winds of hamatan if home was an emotion it would be the vigor and perseverance of niger if home was a place it would be the people I hold close to my heart. Which is why I am never far from home when I transact with First Diaspora. Even if you can't be near your friends and family, you can feel at home every time you transact with First Diaspora. Open a First Diaspora account and you'll always be home, even abroad. Welcome home. Visit www.firstbanknigeria.com You first, First Bank. The finest things of life haven't been so convenient. Whether you are shopping or on a business trip, you are covered by a credit card that gives you more flexibility and convenience to save a life at full crush. You can use the First Bank Visa Gold Card in over 29 million locations and make withdrawals in over 1.8 million ATMs worldwide. Backed by Visa Global Guarantee and Security. Check. Secured by Chip and Pin Technology. Check. Accepted worldwide. Check. Available for use within 24 hours with instant PIN selection at all First Bank ATMs. Check. Emergency card replacement. Check. Emergency cash advance. Check. Access to select global visa privileges and benefits, discounts and rewards at Choice Hospitality Centers worldwide. Check. Valid for up to three years. Check. Cat control with cat services on First Mobile. Check. Don't make your next trip without a First Bank Visa Gold credit card. Walk into any First Bank branch to get the credit card that lets you do more today. You first. First Bank. 
It's time for First Bank's Win Big Promo! 170 million Naira up for grabs! Open or reactivate your First Bank account, deposit and maintain a minimum of 5,000 Naira for just 30 days and the soft life begins! Transact up to 5 times on our digital channels and guess what? You could be a lucky 100,000 Naira winner each month! But wait, there's more! Deposit and maintain 50,000 Naira each month! for 4 months or deposit 200,000 Naira for 4 months and you could stand a chance to win a whooping 1 million Naira in the grand finale Don't miss your chance to win big with First Bank This promo runs till February 23rd, 2024 and is open to new and existing account holders Terms and conditions apply Keep transacting, keep winning You first, First Bank <laughs> Hello there! Welcome to our Digital Experience Center. As you know, we love putting you first in everything we do. We've got the ATMs, so you don't have to walk into any banking hall. And if you want to deposit, you can too with the Telecash Recycler. We have a self-service kiosk available for your personal banking services like your statement request, card block, pin reset, and other requests. The self-service kiosk offers these various services for all your banking queries and needs. There is the card issuance machine for your new ATM card on the go with no hassles. For our trendy customers, we've got video banking available with ease you can sit and carry out all your banking needs. First Bank Digital Experience Center is innovative, automated and interactive. It's your one-stop banking solution to a fully digital banking experience. Step in and enjoy a world of possibilities. You first, first bank. Emergencies happen when you least expect them to. It gets worse when you are cash trapped. No need to despair. First Advance has you covered. You can get that urgent cash right now on First Advance. With First Advance, salary earners can get up to 50% of their salary no hassles as long as you earn a monthly salary and your salary account has been active for at least two months just dial star 894 star 11 hash or simply dial star 894 hash on your mobile phone what's more when you open a first bank salary account you can enjoy zero charges and free debit card issuance download the first mobile app on play store or app store today log in to experience first bank digital banking Select Loans, select First Advance and follow the prompts to receive your loan. Don't let that urgent need get the best of you. Get First Advance now. It's as simple as dialing star 894 star. Money distinguished customers, stakeholders and First Bank leadership team. You're welcome to 2024. First Bank Economic Outlook. Um, this year's event promises to be very, very exciting intellectually and pragmatically relevant to today's economic environment in Nigeria. The theme is actually a, a correct capture of where we are and what we should expect. It um, is prospect in the midst of uncertainties. Uh, so the realities we are in there are significant opportunities, and today we'll be deliberating around that. We've assembled the right panelists uh, with the right knowledge and economic base in terms of what trying to identify the correct in, in, uh, data points as well as opportunities within the environment. So I welcome you especially to this year's 2024 Economic Outlook organized by First Bank. Your bank, a bank that understands how to support customers, we pride ourselves as a trusted advisor to our clients because we follow them all the way and give them the right advice to prosper. So on that note, I welcome the group CEO, 
First Bank Group, uh, Dr. Adeshola Adedotu, to give us his short opening remarks. Thank you, CEO. Good morning, um, distinguished um, customers and my colleagues within the institution. Let me start uh, by wishing each and every one of us a happy and prosperous uh, 2024. Uh, I'm sure we are all delighted to be in 2024, given the significant uh, headwinds that we encountered both at the national level and at the global level in the course of 2023. Um, I'm sure we can all give a sigh of relief that eventually 2024 is here. And um, I believe it offers us, both in our private and corporate capacity, the opportunity to refresh, rethink, and recalibrate our businesses to align with the opportunities available in the current uh, environment. 2023 is history. But when you look and you roll forward, now that we're in 2024, what you will realize is if you don't quickly understand the direction of travel, as far as um, it relates to government policies, government priorities, and how we as private sectors, we can be an integral part of that and use it to aid the further growth of our business, then we have missed an opportunity. And history tells us that um, history tends to be kinder to people who win over and above people who can eloquently explain why they failed. So, um, so the option of failing is actually not what we should be thinking about. For us as Nigerians, I think the year started on a very strong uh, footing with the president, commander-in-chief, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, signing the 2024 appropriation bill into law um, with a record proposed spending of 28 7 trillion naira, which is the highest in the history of the country in nominal terms. More exciting is the fact that about 10 trillion, 9.9 .9 trillion specifically, is budgeted for capital expenditure. So, by implication, there will be significant, uh, we believe there's significant spending that is planned that will allow, that should create enough stimulus within the economy that allows significant and serious players to be able to tap into the growth and the, um, the aspiration of the government. The budget assumed a growth um, expectation of about 3.76, even though the, what is being projected by IMF is slightly lower at about 3.0, at about 3 which in itself is slightly lower than the sub-Saharan African average of about 4.2. But given the size of our economy, whether you are looking at 3% or 3.7% growth, the growth is significant. And serious players, we do have opportunity uh, to tap into this. And that is the focus of this morning's edition. How do we, as First Bank, a bank that has aided and supported our customers through different economy cycles over the last 130 years, how do we continue to play that pivotal role to hate your business, to hate your understanding of how experts and ourselves believe the economy is likely to pan out in the course of 2024 to ensure that you take full benefit of that? Um, we look forward to a very exciting and very interactive uh, session. Um, we remain very committed to supporting your businesses and you can always count on us. We see ourselves as your trusted business advisor, the institution you can always count on, either in terms of financing or providing real business advice, or even just um, being there for you at all the times. Um, so you can always count on us. So thank you for coming. And 
this morning as we just settle in and we go through this. We are excited about the opportunities that the economy offers. And we believe um, after today, um, you will, the takeaway will be such that it will positively impact your business. Thank you. Thank you, First Bank Group CEO. He's actually the, the chief relationship manager for the customer. So, distinguished customers, anytime you have big things, big ideas to discuss, he is your chief customer relationship management officer, and he gladly does that. Again, all geared towards supporting your business. On that note, I'll be calling our guest speaker a very, very knowledgeable economic expert. He is not an economic expert that comes to give you theories. He touches on the practical and pragmatic steps for customers, corporate individuals to actually take advantage of things that are happening within the economy, in, especially in Africa. So he's spent about 40 something years doing this over and over again. And he's invested a lot of time trying to dissect and draw insight that he uses to support customers. On that note, I invite Dr. Biodun Adedikwe. Welcome, Dr. Biodun. The group's CEO, the top management of First Bank, the distinguished customers of the bank, a very good morning to you all. And I want to say very quickly a big thank you to First Bank leadership for having me stand here to share my views about economic outlook, current realities, and prospects for the Nigerian economy. And I'm happy also to let the audience know that this March will mark 30 years of my relationship with First Bank. And then also as a customer since July 1996. And so I'm always very happy each time I'm in First Bank company. And in fact, I'm one of those that First Bank doesn't pay a dime to. But I promote the bank and the brand anywhere I go. <laughs> and it's not because I want First Bank to give me business. Okay? It's about the fact that I've been a part of a number of things the bank has done quite well for their customers. And incidentally, I discussed that with Tosi when I got in here. The first bank was the first financial institution in Nigeria to deliberately open the eyes of their customers to the opportunities in the export value chains. And in discussing that incidentally, when the group CEO made his opening remarks, and that was why I was just sitting there smiling, you know, he made some comments on that. So, what I've done here is to put together a deck of slides. I won't necessarily run through all the slides. I have only 30 minutes. But I will speak to the key issues that can energize us to discuss this money and also go away with some key pointers on what to do. Just like we say here at First Bank, that the essence of this is not necessarily to ask you, please, can I see your wristwatch to tell you what the time is? That's no value adding. But rather, right first bank will say, look, can I see your wristwatch and see what the time is, then tell you what you should be doing at this time of the day. So which is the context we set this outlook on. So where we start from is do a few minutes quickly to look at the global environment we're operating, then come home to Nigeria. What are the peculiarities of our economy? Those things we call the realities that we face today and then do an outlook, what to expect, and possibly begin to talk about pointers as to what to do. Now, in terms of what is happening globally, this time last year, we we're looking at five major global disruptions that anyone in business around the world will need to deal with. The Ukraine-Russia war, which had had several appellations. First, starting with Russia invasion of Ukraine. Then later, we said it's Russia-Ukrainian war. And then later we say Russian war on Ukraine. And now simply we say Ukraine war. All right? And then, of course, that showed us clearly that whenever things happen anywhere in the world, 
don't assume that it doesn't affect you. Because we woke up here in Nigeria and the cost of bread, a wheat derivative, on our breakfast table became higher. And we wondered what happened. We now discovered that Ukraine is systemic in the supply of grains to the world market, 24.1%. And then we moved on from there and said, oh, pandemic is still there. Its effect is lingering. So what is it still bringing up? That connected us to the third disruption, macroeconomic instability. And of course, getting to that, we also saw very clearly that nations we are dealing with inflationary pressures, some had unemployment issues. For some others, it's the flip side of unemployment, in which case they were having people facing job opportunities, they're backing away because they want a situation where they should be talking about, can I work remotely? If there's no remote opportunity here, I don't want the job. Some nations, we are dealing with that. And of course, for some others, like Nigeria, Pakistan, and a couple of others, is the exchange value of their currency. And of course, insufficiency of supply of FX to the FX market. Of course, in some other jurisdictions, it was to do with interest rates, which of course, again, in response to inflation, inflationary pressures, most central banks and reserve banks raised you know, interest rates, monetary policy rates, as we call it in Nigeria. We call that normalization at the time. Of course, we moved on from there and talked about social divisiveness deepening all around the world, where instead of the political and social force being bridged, they were actually expanding more and creating a lot of pressures. Then geopolitics, of course, creating tensions that are driven by alliances and positive, of course, of influence and dominance. Now, those were the five we started the year with. But by the time we ended 2023, three others had been added. One is climate change effect, which we never realized until sometime in October, the Indian government put out a policy shift where they said, look, from this very month, we are putting a restriction on the export of non basmati rice. That was where we realized that India is also systemic in the supply of rice to the international market, 40.1%. Because all over the world, not just in Nigeria, the price of rice went up. And that was how we now saw that, that connection. And then, of course, following that is the issue of the BRICS Plus. We call it now BRICS Plus, no longer BRICS. Okay, the idea was that about 55 countries around the world applied to the BRICS to join that particular group. Of course, at the end of the day, deliberations at their meetings, they approved six. But one of them dropped out by this month because they were supposed to become former members of the BRICS by January 2024. But Argentina backed out for obvious reasons. I always say the reason is very obvious. Argentina also has currency crisis and, of course, inflation crisis. And so the immediate bailout for them could only come from IMF. And if Argentina went on with BRICS plus, then IMF is likely to turn its back on them. So Argentina immediately signaled that, look, we are not joining BRICS again January 2024. But of course, that gave them a reprieve. Got they got an access to $4.7 billion from IMF support. And of course, still, you know, scratching their heads on how to deal with problem of inflation. Israel Hamas war. Friday like this, we all went to bed feeling cool and life normal. Woke up on a Saturday morning, invasion of Israel by some terrorists. And of course, that became a big issue. As of today, a big worry in terms of countries aligning, and maybe this will likely destabilize the Middle East. Only this morning I saw the news that the U.S. government officially has now announced commitment to a two-party state, which there will be a Palestinian state. I got that news very early this morning. So which, of course, is part of the response to that particular crisis. So if all of this are happening around the world, then, of course, now you will see that later, okay? I'm not talking to that. What I did there was to simply say, okay, the BRICS Plus, all those countries, there are 10 of them. What is their GDP, number one? What is their population? What is their per capita? Okay? And then how does that play out compared to the global GDP, that the world GDP, and then the world population? So what percentage? And if you look at that, you see just a little below 30% in terms of GDP, 
but a little above 40% in terms of population. But when you now check out GDP per capita, you see very interesting things play out there. You see India, yes, most populated country in the world today, they overtook China June 2023. It will become the most populated country. And China, of course, has a peculiar thing there. Yes, the population is large. They are number two now. But it's an aging population. And I'm saying that now to connect to one of the things the GMD said in his opening remarks. And that is looking out for opportunities. Okay? Now, the Chinese population is aging. Median age is 38 years. Indian population is younger. Median age is 28 years. Nigerian population much younger. Median age 17.2 years. Okay? So that is, we come to that when I do the outlook. Now, when the new government came into office, May 29, there were a number of policy shifts announced. First subsidy removal. And by the way, I also remind people about this. President Tinubu didn't remove subsidy. People often wonder when I say that. And I remind them that, look, subsidy was removed effectively and legally December 2021 when the petroleum industry bill was signed into an act. But President Bwari then made a remark that the sections relating to subsidy, sections 205 to 208 of that act, will not be implemented until 18 months' time. So in my small mind, I did the calculation. 18 months' time will be June 2023. And I said, that means when this happened, after the man has left the office, Whoever, therefore, will take over after him will carry the can of him, he said, as the person that removes subsidy. That was the way I, I, I interpreted it. So, I remember as a guest on Chinese TV, <laughs> I made a comment, January 2022, that the old man just kicked the can down the road, okay, by 18 months. So, that was one part, legally removed. The other part is the budget for 2023, also signed into law, became from bill to an act. In that also, no provision for fair subsidy for the second half year. So quick meant two legal documents were in place before President Tinubu was sworn into office. So for me, when he said subsidy is gone, I said, yes, the man is just reminding us that I've entered office now. I didn't mean subsidy. That's my interpretation. But we talk about implications, cost of doing business and cost of living. All right? Quick to connect to some of the things we'll tell you later what your company should be doing at a time like this. Unified exchange rates, of course, we've done that many, many times. Maybe in the last 40 years, there about, at what I call it episodic, you know, removal of subsidy in the FX, in FX price, let me put it that way. And there are different days we can make reference to. But there's something peculiar about our economy. Yes, we are Lightly import dependent for consumption. And I say that deliberately. Because oftentimes when you make reference to the import data of Nigeria for the first nine months of last year, we don't have the trade data for the last quarter yet. But for the first nine months of the year, average monthly import bill, merchandise import for Nigeria was 1.88 trillion naira. Average monthly. Now, you look at that and use the official exchange rate to convert to dollars, that gives you about $2.3 billion every month. Now, you can look at that and say, in the last 10 years, our import bill has been growing. A reflection of our dependence on imported items for consumption, largely. Then the other side of it is, because some analysts will argue, I say, look, Dr. Edipe, we don't agree with you on that. And I ask them why. They say, look, Nigeria's import per capita is very low. Nigeria's import relative to GDP, is very low. I said, look, that is dubious analysis. Why do I call that dubious analysis? Nigeria's population is largest in Africa, and we are number six in the world. 223.8 million people estimated by United Nations, which is the data we use for population. Now, the other side to it is that when you look at our GDP as well, whichever way you look at it, our GDP, of course, in terms of positioning, had been at number 24, 26, went to 33. I checked again yesterday, 39. And all I could put it down to is that, look, this ranking is the dollar GDP, which means each time the Naira dollar exchange rate moves, three things happen. Number one, 
because we are largely import dependent. It makes everyone that consumes imported items poorer in real terms. Secondly, it makes companies smaller because your dollar balance sheet becomes smaller. All right? Thirdly now is the ranking of the economy in terms of GDP ranking. So that we are number 39 today doesn't mean the economy is not growing. And that's why I can relate with the comment of the GMD earlier on. So if we expect this economy to grow this year, and this is the challenge I always pose to business people, what then is your own expectation? What do you want to do? Now, you cannot afford to grow slower than the rate at which the economy you are operating in is growing. If you grow slower, that means some entity within that space, not necessarily your direct competition, but somebody somewhere is growing at your expense. Because that growth rate is aggregate, all right? In which case, if there's any expectation, and every outlook I've considered that I've seen so far is projecting growth for the Nigerian economy. That of the World Bank came out this week in the Global Economic Prospects, and they expect this economy to grow by 3.3% this year. So if everybody expects the economy to grow, why then aren't you focusing on the opportunities rather than discussing challenges? Okay? That's the point I want to leave there. Of course, positive fiscal consolidation and, of course, an improvement in the business environment. I will stay on this slide for the rest of my presentation. Other slides following this just give you details. So that's why I call it the macroeconomic dashboard. First quarter last year, the economy grew by 2.31%. Second quarter, it grew by 2.51%. Third quarter, of course, it grew by 2.54%. Average of that for the first three quarters of 2023 will give you 2.45%. So when you now try to analyze that, and again, look historically at the usual pace of growth of the Nigerian economy in the fourth quarter, that will probably give you a figure less than 3% for 2023, right? But on the back of that, we then say, what are the sound bites we are getting from Mr. President? And then secondly, what kind of actions are we getting? And that takes me again to the reference to the budget that the MD talked about. Now that's why I said earlier, I kept smiling when he was speaking. Because those are the key issues we should be talking about. Now, if we look at the federal government budget, 28.77 trillion naira, and then the aggregated state government budgets, all the state governments together, about 16.4, they are about trillion naira. So now, that gives you an idea of how much money is coming as stimulus into this economy in 2024. So quick means then that there are opportunities to be created by not only the direct spending, but the multiplier effects those spendings we have within the economy. So if all of these are happening, they create opportunities that even if you don't do business directly with the government, there is an entity somewhere in the value chains that we connect to yours in any case, but we talk about that also later. Of course, improvement in oil production, we've seen that all through 2023. Oil price, very interesting. In fact, when I pick this figure of $79.78 per barrel of Nigeria's body light, that was two days ago, something interesting happened. Because when it comes to the price of crude oil, ladies and gentlemen, the reference has always been the Chinese economy. And the reality is this. In the last 45, it will become 46 years this year. The impetus for global economic growth has come from the Chinese economy. That's the reality. So, and that is why everyone is worried about what is happening in China. In the last couple of years, the Chinese economy has been troubled by developments in this real estate sector. Five years ago, real estate sector in China accounted for 34% of their GDP. As at the end of 2023, it had dropped to 31%. But that sector, of course, the Chinese government also knows, is the one that commands what happens to the economy generally. And so they always want to ensure that if it needs rescue, will intervene. So a lot of stimulus brought in there on the one hand, and also in banking. Then one interesting thing the Chinese government also did was to now say, look, if we are going to stimulate household consumption, then we want to put out stimulus also 
to encourage consumption of household products on the one hand, and then on the other hand, electric vehicles. So the combination of those three, intervention in real estate, in banking, and then household spending, consumer spending, is what the government put out to stimulate the Chinese economy. Now, why did I go into that? Because it's a big and major driver of the price of crude oil in the international oil markets. So what happened two days ago was that data came out about PMI in China. And of course, PMI for services, very bright. The PMI for manufacturing, negative. And so the oil market experienced a dampening. Most oil prices went down two days ago. But interestingly, it was only Nigeria's burning light that gained two days ago. That was when we recorded $79.78 per barrel. So in which case, that side of the equation is good news for Nigeria. All right? Now, external results, that's the one that is... I will, somebody asked me recently, what do you think the government is doing in this regard? I said, I'm not in government. I'm an observer from outside. So what I do is, I look for data and then try to interpret. So when I go to the website of Central Bank, I see external results. Of course, I know that is not the actual as of today. Because when SLS, that's His Royal Highness, was CBN governor, they changed the way that data is presented to the public from actual to moving average. So what you see on CBN website today is a moving average. But even at that, since he adopted that in 2012 till date, that moving average, I would say, has more or less normalized over time. So you can play with it. So what we do then is we look at that figure. It's in two components, the liquid portion and the blocked portion. So take out the liquid portion and then go back to the trade data I mentioned earlier on, the import data. Divide that external result liquid portion by the import bill, monthly import bill. So that gives you an idea of how many months of cover the external, liquid external results we have assures you. In exchange rate economics, minimum expected for exchange rate stability is six months. So if you check that out with the later data early this week, it will give you 8.4 months thereabout. Okay? So from the perspective of exchange rate stability, that will be positive, so to say, okay, because it's above six months. Of course, some analysts will say, look, let's even look at three months cover. But three months cover will be applicable to an FX market that is very, very liquid. But I will leave it there, okay? So if you check that out, the question then will be, are there obligations we have not extinguished that relate to the external results? We take those ones, we back them out. So after backing those out was when I came up with the figure of eight point something months. So that is mature obligations not yet extinguished. Okay? So it means from that perspective, it looks okay. But again, it's a different ball game. If you are the one sitting in Yemi Kadoso's chair, where you deal with the actual number. So that is why I can't second guess him. So I stay within what the data available suggests. So we we'll come to that later. Now, exchange rate itself, and that takes from unified exchange rates. And that's an area where if I were to advise Mr. President, I would say they need to take a second look at that policy of unified exchange rates. It has benefits variously, but one interesting benefit, which I will point out very quickly, is that differential that comes on account of that has been a major influence in Fed allocation. Because when you convert petrol dollar to Naira, you now get a lot more Naira. So more money is now available Naira-wise to share among the three tiers of government. And so that has gone up significantly. And a portion of that is driven by the exchange value of the Naira. The other side is when Mr. President submitted the budget and the, the, the bill, okay, to the National Assembly. The National Assembly said, well, we've looked at it, it makes a lot of sense, but then there are some MDAs that came back and brought further requests. How do we deal with this? Integrate them into what we have already. They said, well, 
the way to go is move the assumption and the budget from 750 naira to a dollar to 800 naira to the dollar. And then when you do that, we'll be able to cover those requests. And of course, I observed like the GMB said earlier on, that the increase made by the National Assembly to the budget submitted by the President was strictly 100% capital. And so I told myself that if the increase they brought in was all for capital expenditure proposals, that means the budget in terms of structure is going in the positive direction we had last seen in Nigeria in the 1990s. Since the 2000s, our budget had been more skewed towards recurrent expenditure. So if you look at the one for this year, in fact, don't go too far. Just compare with budget of last year. We see the major shift in the structure. Which for me is a tick. It's positive. Because we are now putting more resources into infrastructure. Which means that if you are spending on capital, not buying cars and printers. Because those are also part of capital spending anyway. You, know, you buy cars, you buy printers, you buy computers, they are part of that. But when emphasis shifts more into infrastructure, then it makes my mind go back to 2004. We all look at China today as driving the global economy. It was deliberate, planned, and executed. And that also will bring in something I will remark on shortly. And that is, when the Chinese started in 2004 focusing on infrastructure, what they did simply was to say, different infrastructure items. Let's set goals that are time-bound. And let's also look at the country that's the best in the world in that area. And then they become the one we are targeting to outcompete. So for us, they went for U.S. with the longest trade of expressways in the world, 75,000 kilometers. So China set a target of, to construct 85,000 kilometers in 30 years. Okay, by 2007, three years later, they had done 57,000. So they shifted the delivery date from 2034 to 2010. 2011, China achieved it. Then for railway, they picked Russia, longest stretch of railway in the world. They said, we want to construct a longer rail network than Russia's and deliver that by 2012. I was on holiday in England when China achieved that because a train arrived in London from China carrying manufactured goods. So when it arrived in London, they had a rib in front of the engine. So I witnessed it live when it came in and was celebrated. But of course, when that happened, my mind went back to 2004 because we had advocated this for Nigeria as, as well, where we came up with the idea of infrastructure Nigeria in 2008 to President Yaradua at the time. So when I looked at the budget of this year, therefore, and I see two occasions that President Tinubu signed and released money for infrastructure purposes to the state governments. For me, that means we are pulling in the right direction. All right? Now, of course, we look at, and this is an interesting one to point out here, the exchange rate at the official window, NAFEX, the exchange rate at the parallel market. I checked the two of them out. December 2022 to December 2023, we unified exchange rates. The devaluation of the Naira at the official window was 100.4%. When you check the parallel market data, the depreciation, noting the different words now, the depreciation there was 39.5%. In which case, Naira diminution in value was smaller in the parallel market than the official market. But the unfortunate thing for this economy is that when merchandise traders price their products, they don't make reference to the depreciation in the parallel market. Where they claim the source effects from? Rather, the price based on devaluation in the official segment of the market. And so you find, therefore, that pricing of commodities generally, which is what one of the things fueling inflation in Nigeria, is actually driven by this interaction that most analysts don't see but in reality, that is what is happening in the market. And I'm happy also that recently, you know, President Tinubu made a remark on that. And I told myself that, look, this president must have people that are not only analyzing what is going on in the market, but giving the right feedback 
And he's also responding to that. Which, of course, is important for us as business people. So, we have entered a period where we say that policy advocacy is something we must all actively engage in. I mean, engage in. Because it seems so far that we have a president who takes the feedback and the response to what he hears. That is an environment for policy advocates to try. So whichever trade group or association you belong to, as a customer of First Bank, please be active there. And of course, advocate policies that will work well for the private sector. Why do I say that? When you aggregate our GDP, and then you compare all government expenditure, federal, state, local, and then you place side by side with our GDP, you find a figure of about 11%. It used to be 9.6% some couple of years ago. Which means that the value being created in Nigeria is mostly coming from the private sector. That's what it means. Even that assumption I made is that every state government, local and federal, they will find the NARA required to execute their budgets 100% which is not always so. So even if they borrow and now execute 100%, the spend compared to our GDP is just about 11%. Which means what actually drives this economy, the value being created, is mostly for the private sector. That's also part of what you need to understand so that when we do our advocacy, we know where we are coming from. Monetary policy rate, 18.75%, I usually play that against inflation rate. Latest data on inflation was for November, 28.2%. And of course, NPR at 18.75% will interpret as negative interest rate. And so when we look at that, two things will play out. Is there a likelihood that a central bank that has returned to orthodox monetary policy will look at that and say, we need to correct that? How do we correct it? You see that we take up NPR, okay? in order to reduce the negative interest rate, or alternatively, what can we do to bring down the rate of inflation? Now, I've checked that out over time, that the influence of NPR movement on inflation rate in Nigeria is about 33%, looking at data from 1970 to date. Okay? So now, what that also means is that, yes, many other things affect inflation rate in Nigeria. And of course, as I said earlier, mostly the exchange value of the Naira. Because we are largely import dependent for consumption. All right? Now, if you play that out, then what it tells you is this. All right. My hand touched the button here. Sorry about that. Now, if you look at inflation in Nigeria, 28.2% for November. But when you check food inflation, you find it at 32.84%. So, and of course, food inflation is a major, major driver of inflation in Nigeria. And then we say, okay, how do we deal with that? Two major issues. One is security. It's important because that is affecting adversely most of the zones where we cultivate food that we consume in Nigeria. I call it the food basket in terms of the region. Secondly, is post-harvest loss, which is estimated at close to 60%. Which then points to the fact that if this will be corrected. Those two elements will be dealt with. In the private conversation that Usi and I had earlier, we are talking about processing, all right? And you will, of course, get that from First Bank later this morning. That one of the key things to addressing food inflation in Nigeria is to deal with post harvest losses with two twin, let me call it two-pronged solution. One is processing. The second is storage. That if you're able to do that, then we can have also a situation where those products can be preserved and made available to the market all year round. The other part, of course, will be all year farming, not rain fed farming, which means we'll invest in infrastructure for irrigation. Then security will now be the big number that makes farmers to go to their farms, cultivate, bring out the harvest, and return there because they have no fear that one rascal will come to challenge them and possibly kill them at the farms. So if we do all that, what it will do is to deal with the first two and important elements of food security. Because every year, the Economic Intelligence Unit does a report on food security globally. 
And there are four elements they look at. For me, the first two elements are critical to Nigeria in dealing with food security and inflation. And that is availability and then affordability. Those are the first two elements of the four factor food security. So if we do those things I mentioned, then food security can actually improve in the area of availability and affordability. Stock index, that is stock market. Good news, all true. But I have a slide, you will get that later, okay? That shows how the stock market in Nigeria moved from May up until the end of 2023. Very interesting on a monthly basis. What is the year to date rate of return? And then you look at market capitalization and look at the index. The year ended at 45.9% year to date return. That is quite significant. We are still collecting data for stock markets all over the world. And I'm very sure with this kind of return, Nigeria's stock market probably will be part of the top 10 in 2023. So quit, of course, is a good pointer to what is happening in the environment because the top stock market, when we look at economies and want to form outlook, is one plank we look at as giving you an indication of what the organized private sector, the cream of it, actually thinks. Because the more people invest in those stocks, the more confident they are about the economy that stock market is resident in. In fact, that is what is behind the story of the BRICS, by the way. Just to let you see the relevance of this. The BRICS came up in 20, 2001 as an idea. The new building blocks of the global economy for the first half of the new century. That was the way Jimone put it of Goldman Sachs. And so the idea was that Brazil, Russia, India, and China will have their stock markets grow significantly and therefore present opportunity for wealth creation. And it happened the first four years of the new century. By 2004, the stock markets of those four countries grew by between 423% and 640%. And so that is the story behind a review of that particular model. And then that threw up the next level among which Nigeria is a member. That is the story between next level. I think I did an article that was probably the first bank review sometime in 2011 on that. Okay? So now, stock market grew significantly. Capital importation tentative. Of course, the aggregate for the first three quarters of the year. Is what we have there. Let me now go to the outlook. And then, thereafter, we're going to panel discussion. Like I said, you get a lot of data and information after this particular slide, okay, that you can take away and look at at your own time. Now, when it comes to the outlook, what are the things we look at? Number one, as I said earlier on, the Nigerian population is large, number six in the world. And it is also peculiar. You won't see this in writing my slides. Peculiar in the sense that the Nigerian population will buy anything. We consume anything. That means whatever you produce in Nigeria, we buy it. It's a good environment for business. But there's also something happening in Nigeria, and that, is, that should be of interest to you. Now, globally, there's a pattern with global trade. The pattern shift in the last three years is that most of the companies producing and exporting are now shifting their manufacturing activities to the countries they export to. So now, when I say this, it was at a meeting during Salami and I had, I think January last year, I said, I've seen some evidence of new manufacturing in Nigeria. But he now said, yes, doctor, I can relate to that because I also did a study recently, and I saw a shift of manufacturing from the countries exporting to the market they export to. I said, okay, so the two of us, we can combine our findings to now come to the position that, yes, the new manufacturing happening in Nigeria is not necessarily out of sync. Nigeria is the market for those products. But the manufacturers now say, we want to come here to produce instead of stay where we are and export it because there's a global shift of trade. Post COVID, COVID is a different, but I don't have time to go into all of that. So, but the question now is, 
Who are those taking advantage of this new manufacturing window? We found mostly three nationalities. The Chinese, the Indians, and the Lebanese. Those are our findings. Okay? So, at each time I see that, I ask myself, what are Nigerians who have capacity to invest in manufacturing dream? And that's why I like what First Bank is doing here today. To open your eyes to opportunities. Because most of them talk about challenges. And when you focus on challenges, you get paralyzed. That's my interpretation. But when you focus on opportunities, you get energized. All right? So now, the population is not only large, number six in the world, it is youthful, as I told you earlier on, but also tech savvy. And that means that if it is tech savvy, then we now ask ourselves, how does that connect to the ICT sector? Which, of course, has consistently in the last three to four years been either number two or number one in terms of contribution to our GDP. You see one of my slides also on that. So the question then is, how do we deal with that as business people? What it says simply is this. Internet penetration in Nigeria. We are number 11 in the world. And of course, when you talk about access to internet, most Nigerians do that with their phones. 94%. So in which case, whichever industry you are in, we have entered an era where technology becomes a key thing. We call it digitalization. All right? It simply means you look at your entire business, and the new one coming strongly this year, which is, of course, worrisome, is generative artificial intelligence, which is very, very interesting. I've done quite some work in that area also. Very interesting. But the way it is playing out is that how do you bring that into your business model and then ensure that you are running a business that is 21st century fit and not a business in 21st century. You see a 20th century business model. Okay? So all of this play out, and what we say is that look at your entire processes and consider those that you can automate on the one hand and then also look at possibility of end-to-end -end digitization. I will leave it there for the tech people. All right? Now, if that is the combination of the population and technology, what else can we say about Nigeria? We make so much noise about infrastructure gap. But I'm always happy to remind people that infrastructure gap in Nigeria some 13 years ago, when I did that article published in First Bank Review, because what First Bank mandated me to do is to look at the next level and then review their infrastructure. So, in that article, I was able to establish where Nigeria was among those 11 countries, infrastructure-wise. But when I did that article, there was no real functional in Nigeria. But as of today, there are three functional rail corridors. Lagos to Ibadan, Kaduna to Abuja, Wari to Itakwe, functional. It wasn't there 10 years ago. Equally, 10 years ago, most of our expressways were in bad shape. Some of them today are in good shape. Lagos, Ibadan is one. If you travel, Kano, Zari are similar because I did that personally, so I can talk about it. Only a few places to finish as at November when I traveled that road. Okay? And there are a number of all roads again in Nigeria. So, it means what I saw there when I wrote that I could take for publication in Fed Bank Review is not exactly where we are today. Look at our airport terminals as well. I recall an incident where I landed in Port Court and it was raining heavily. So between the plane and the canopy that was the terminal building at the time, the rain beat me like no man's business. So but today, Port Court has a very beautiful terminal building. It's not only Port Court, all over Nigeria. That's part of infrastructure and several other things. So the narrative, therefore, about infrastructure, actually, that we keep saying is negative. That's why people are not investing in Nigeria. For me, it's just an excuse. It's improving. Okay? So, with them means that, what can I see as pointers there? So, I will conclude it this way. What is my expectation with respect to interest rate, with respect to exchange rate, with respect to GDP growth rate? I will leave it at those three and then conclude. 
for interest rate. The CBN government indicated that CBN is now going the way of orthodox monetary policy, which means no mission drift, as we had during a Mayfield's era, because CBN was on mission drift at the time. Okay? This time around, no mission drift. So if they are focusing on orthodox monetary policy, then that will suggest the likelihood that CBN will tick up the NPR in order to close the gap between it and inflation rate. But again, we had Mr. President made a remark that this government wants to encourage consumer credit. And if you want to encourage consumer credit, then interest rates need to go down. Which is why, in my interpretation, ordinarily, if CBN will go orthodox, as reserve banks and central banks have done all over the world, especially in the last three years of normalization, we will expect CBN to mark up NPR in order to deal with inflation. But of course, the policy pronouncement on consumer credit, which the president also said will require interest rates to drop, will mean CBN is also watching the other side, which is like what the body language of Mr. President. And so we may therefore not see NPR go up significantly. In fact, that also is on the back of a monetary policy committee reconstituted. So that committee has not met last three dates they were supposed to meet. So my interpretation of that is NPR may not likely change. But if it will change at all, that change will happen only the first half of this year. And so second half of this year, we expect NPR to go down. Okay? That's on the one side. Exchange rate. Yes, different entities have done expectations of exchange rate for Nigeria. If you look at JP Morgan, you look at the World Bank, IMF, the one that is frightening is EIU, Economic Intelligence Unit. Because they said, if you continue with this unified exchange rate, we may see Naira go to 2,000 Naira to a dollar. But I now said, hey, it may not necessarily work out that way. And why do I not expect it to go that way? Number one, you know, as bankers, there are 12 factors we watch to form our own opinion about the direction of movement of exchange rate. One big one there is what they call significant utterances of key government functionaries. And so we take from what Mr. President is saying, we take from what the finance minister is saying, we take from what the CBN governor is saying, and then we look also at the budget. Budget assumption, 800 naira to the dollar. And then we look at all these other indications. Some time ago, the finance minister said they expect Naira to set in the range of 650 to 750 before they came up with budget as much as 750. That now assembly ticked up to 800. Okay? So, but looking at how the market has behaved between June 2023 and beginning of this year, we have, you know, an outlook of an average of official rate around 900 Naira. Then, you know, the pattern is this, and I will use a quick illustration we can relate with. Typically, anytime there's a major shift or disruption in any economy, a new equilibrium is created. And that was what happened when first subsidy removal was implemented. That's the way I would put it. When it was implemented, for those of us living in Lagos, you must have observed something. There were fewer vehicles on the roads initially. But as soon as people got used to the new prices, we entered a new equilibrium. Vehicles returned to Lagos roads. The traffic jam that we knew before again returned. So in which case, once you get to a new equilibrium, everything settles. So and that is what is driving our own outlook on the exchange value of the Naira. We don't see it at the parallel market going beyond 1,235 Naira to the dollar. That's our expectation. It can't go beyond that. All right? Yes, it may take up, but we return to that level. And we've seen that play out, you know, episodically. So we then look at what is the major driver of that, the supply of the market. And that's where I'm sure First Bank will connect with you as its customer this morning. And that is the deliberate promotion of export. In fact, for me, two critical things. One is manufacturing domestically. The other one is export. And there are so many opportunities in the export value chains. And 
Of course, I remarked to Tosi earlier also when I came into the hall that First Bank is the first financial institution in Nigeria I'm aware of. Maybe I don't know enough. Okay? That would deliberately encourage its customers in non oil export. Because I was involved in that discussion. And that was two years ago before the idea even became, well, I won't mention the name of the bank. There's another bank, international, you know, in nature, that now copied what First Bank did only October last year. So in my mind, I said, okay, First Bank is truly the first. So now, so in, in conclusion, what I see more is an economy that will likely grow at about 3.47%. The World Bank indicated 3.3% in the GP published two days ago. But we in BA Consul see 3.47%. IMF probably will come later and revise their own also in their outlook. And of course, different other entities. But everybody is projecting this economy to grow at about 3% this year. And the message to you then is that if the economy you're operating will grow, why don't you also think of what to do? In order to grow your business. Thank you so very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Dr. Adedikwe. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Dedikwe. Um, please, can we give him a round of applause? It was well delivered, insightful, and excellent. Just a reminder, we have over 1,600 customers and stakeholders joining us for this event online. And we welcome the online participants. And that goes to show how relevant and how important this is to most of our customers. We are going into the second session main session of this event that's a panel session and um as usual we have brought in um rounded experts in across every area and in no particular order um i will call on dr adedipe he doesn't need any other introduction um he's one of our panel members and dr adedipe has he spends all his time thinking about what the opportunities will be in the environment and how businesses can tap into those opportunities. We have another panelist. This time, it um, is a panelist that we had wanted to bring here for some time, but we succeeded this year, and that is Jumoke Oduwole. Jumoke is the special advisor to the president on Presidential Enabling Business Environment Council. You will understand why I say he's a very, very important panelist today. She's got most of the policy direction, most of the impact of the policies that the federal government is trying to come up with, and he will bring those to the table to help our customers, our value dear customers, to spot those opportunities and also see how they can key into government reforms. She's, she's been with the reform environment over the last couple of years. Interestingly, um, he's been there for, since 2015 or thereabouts. He's been on loan from the Faculty of Law, University of Lagos, to serve our country. Again, all geared towards improving the economic fortunes of Nigeria. So, especially welcome Jumoke Oduwole to us. Um, she's an international expert because she's also part of the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, she's a senior fellow there and also a senior lecturer at the University of Lagos in international economics. So, welcome Jumoke. Our next speaker is Babajide Ogunso. Um, Babajide doesn't require so much introduction. He's, um, when it comes to crunching the data to 
derive specific insights that will support government as well as businesses. He's an expert. I mean, he's one of the Nigerians that spend a lot of time looking at both global and domestic data, again, to support businesses. And that's why we brought him to here today, to support our customers, derive those insights, and also help them grow their businesses. Welcome, Baba Jide. And our next panelist is uh, Tosin Adewi. Tosin is the ED Corporate Banking First Bank Group. Um, again, for, the, for those in the corporate businesses, uh, he's their, their go-to person when it comes to spotting big corporate opportunities and advising clients on how to take advantage of that. He wakes up every day thinking about her customers, especially Customers of First Bank and potential customers of bank, First Bank, how they can take advantage of the happenings in the economy to deliver significant revenue for their shareholders. So, Tilson, well, you're welcome. And today, um, together, we'll be looking at how businesses in the current realities we make fortune, how businesses, especially First Bank customers and potential customers, we leverage the current, uh, the current realities in the Nigerian economy as well as in the, in the global economy to make more money to support the society and create employment. So you're welcome to today's panel. Um, we'll go straight to the event right away. I will take my seat. So thank you once again. Um, we are into, on to the re-panel event, and this event is where we expound more on the keynote speaker's um, points. And I'll start with Jumoke. Jumoke, you have most of the First Bank stakeholders, both present here as well as online. Uh, you've been with the government in terms of reform. I would like to ask you, what should the business community expect from the presidential Enabling Business Environment Council in terms of reforms that will help them in 2024. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you all very much. Um, thank you for the warm invitation to the First Bank. You've consistently supported the Presidential Enabling Business Environment Council, and I'd like to publicly acknowledge that support in the past, and thank you for your continued interest in our work. Good morning to First Bank customers and stakeholders. Happy New Year to everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. The PEBEC um, released an outlook on Monday, on the 8th, to let our stakeholders know what to expect in 2024. Just to go over it briefly, we actually released it with targets and it's publicly available so that you can hold us accountable and honest to our commitments. The PEBEC was established in 2016 and over time we've implemented over 180 reforms. The PEBEC Secretariat works with all arms and levels of Nigerian government and the private sector. Some of the pillars that we have traditionally worked on, we took Q4 to look critically, uh, being in a new administration and with a lot of feedback, what has worked, what hasn't, and come up with a new strategy to implement going forward this year. We have five pillars, four of them you know about, we're deepening, and one new one. So you know about our regulatory intervention. The Business Facilitation Act of 2022 is a codification of the EO1 executive order from 2017. It's now a legally binding document. It was signed into law by President Buhari in February, just before the elections, and was passed by the Ninth National Assembly. So all the default approvals, the entry and exit requirements, the single interface and the service level agreements, it speaks to public sector transparency and efficiency of public service delivery. And we work with about 53 ministries, departments and agencies at the federal level. So that work has been ongoing for some years, but it has a more robust legally binding framework. So that implementation work is one of our top priorities this year. The second one that I think is also of critical importance is our subnational intervention. We work with all states and the FCT on business climate reforms. We have done since 2017. But for the last couple of years, we've been working on a program with the World Bank. We co-designed it, the Public Secretariat and the World Bank team, 
with support from the Nigerian Governors Forum, Secretariat, and Home Finance Department of Ministry of Finance. That program uh, implements some of the PEBEC reforms that have been on for a few years. There's $750 million on the table from the World Bank for implementation for three years with participating states. It's a P4R, that's a program for performance for results. So when the states implement, they get a, a refund, and it's a loan from the World Bank to the federal government and on lending to the states. It's part of the borrowing plan that was approved on the 30th of December, 2023. Now that program deepens reforms from land reform, land use, to, we were just talking about internet penetration, to fiber optic framework to encourage private sector. It also works on PPP frameworks across states. It works on regulatory interface across states like payment of taxes, harmonizing, and giving automation. So SABA is an important program for us this year. The states just finished the first year of implementation. They have their state action plans, which is part of their eligibility criteria to implement, to, be, to participate, to be able to participate in the program. And then when they perform their disbursement link indicators and there's an independent verification process, then they get the reimbursement. So about 20, 31 states uh, uh, met the eligibility criteria. And as at 31st, 30, uh, 31st of December, about 24 of those states had submitted what they had done this year and their eligibility to, to participate in 2024. The third one that I talk about is the legislative and judicial our legal interventions are combined this time around. So with legislative intervention, we're going to have another iteration of the omnibus bill. So the Business Facilitation Act is what we had as an omnibus bill. We worked with Nigerian Bar Association, Section of Business Law, and the NESG, and private sector, about 40 firms work pro bono, to, to scoop legislative business climate laws and come up with reviews. So we reviewed the camera that we reenacted. We reviewed about 21 laws in that omnibus bill that was passed into the Business Facilitation Act. So we start a new round, uh, a new iteration of that. And then we continue to work with the judiciary, particularly state judiciaries. In 2023, when we started 2023, eight states, starting with Lagos and Kano, had implemented small claims court, which is a unique intervention for smaller businesses. And um, from the small claims courts from 28, we ended the year with, from eight, we ended the year with 25 states having implemented small claims courts. We have a strategic communication intervention which continues to tell public, private sector and stakeholders what exactly it is that the PEBEC is doing. And that's where First Bank support came in some years ago to pay an independent consultant to support us with the amplification of that messaging. But the final pillar and the new one that I'd like to share today is our Business Champions Program. Having worked with MSMEs for a few years, we realized that really, while these systemic interventions from working on the airports, the seaports, are good and really necessary, we, need, we can't keep trying to boil the ocean or to eat an elephant. We had to really be more targeted. So the Business Champions Interventions targets medium to larger size enterprises, and there's two parts to that program. The first part is to work with medium-sized enterprises, have a, a pilot program of about 25 of them, which we're selecting them for uh, the revenue they contribute, the, the tax they, they remit, how many jobs they create, the export process they generate, and we'll be helping them with a bespoke service to, to navigate the business climate, particularly from the government side. So it's just sort of having a concert service for businesses. And then we saw that. Nigeria has only 23 businesses that are over a billion dollars in revenue annually, uh, while a, a country like South Africa has much more. Out of the 300 and about 34 of them in, in Africa, only 23 are in Nigeria. So we're going to be targeting, supporting those businesses specifically, so that's a cohort. And actually, FBN Holdings is one of those companies. So we'll be reaching out to ask you what your challenges are and working with you specifically. And why we've decided to change models. Yeah, this is the first time I'm actually saying it. We haven't released the numbers, but yes, you're the first to know and you're the first to, so I guess you really are the first. <laughs> um, why we decided to shift the model is because businesses that are large have an osmosis effect. And so the clustering of the stakeholders around, and I'm sure there'll be more questions 
around that. We, de we, we determined that we need to have this new approach to move faster and to grow the economy faster in these turbulent times. I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jumoke. I mean, we can give her another round of applause. It was, she's quite spot on, and that's why we brought her here. Uh, Tosi, I will take it up from where Jumoke stopped and come back to you. Um, you see, the new government has renewed focus on export-related businesses. Again, you're the person in the field, you interact with customers, you know what is happening in the economy. If I may ask, what do you think, um, how do you think companies or businesses that either are doing export oriented business today or potentially want to enter into that segment, how would they position to take advantage of most of the reform policies in that segment to make more money? And are there specific first bank interventions or initiatives to support people in the business uh, in the export business oriented area thank you Tulsi. thank you chike and thank you to all our guests panelists and clients how do clients position it's quite easy position with first bank and you'll be fine and and sometimes it's nice to to get the validation when when doctor mentioned that we we were already working on exports and focus on exports before it actually became sexy um we had set up an exports, a dedicated exports desk. We run workshop with clients, just understanding their process and, and how they can export. And so I think we've got it nailed down. In fact, we are expanding that team um, because there's just so much demand for time. Lighton, please raise your hand. That team sits in, in Lighton's um, shop. So if you want to grab her afterwards, please, please do that. Many years ago, I was on a flight from Kenya to London, and I always liked sitting next to a window. And I sat next to the window, and they were loading flowers, uh, and flowers loading to London, fresh flowers. And I just thought, that's, that's interesting. And so when I got into London, I started doing some research. I abandoned it after a while, by the way. I started doing some research, but at that time, Kenya to Europe in flowers was about a billion dollars. This is many years ago. And this is just one item. And I, I thought that was really interesting. But of course, um, there's the logistics, there's the customs, there's the ports. The flowers have to go that night, otherwise the whole, the whole consignment is, is damaged. And recently I, I tried to pretend to be romantic, so I, I ordered some flowers for my well, the flowers were actually of comparable quality to the flowers in London. I didn't ask whether they were plant grown here or the flowers themselves were imported from, I don't, I don't know. Um, but it just shows there's just so many opportunities. And every day we go and meet with clients. Clients haven't even thought about exports of their, their goods and services. We are quite good now at exporting natural resources, raw materials, let's, let's use the word raw materials, um, in the raw form. And I think from a first bank perspective, we've transitioned away from just exporting cocoa, or just exporting scrap steel, or scrap metal. It's really about processing, or at least the first stage processing. Because okay. the more of that you do in country, the more value you trap in country. And I think that's really where the move is. This will certainly be our focus for 2024. And so again, there's a knock-on effect. If you need to do processing or you advise clients to do processing, then they have to invest in plant and machinery that allows them to do that. And again, we're seeing quite a number of discussions um, there. there. There are companies who are investing. And sometimes you come away with a negative outlook of what's going on in the country. Interestingly, many of our clients are here. So the references to the Indian, the Chinese, and the Lebanese. Again, Light has joined every meeting this week. I think every meeting this week, we have met a new Chinese company who is coming in for the first time. Every single day this week, we've had a meeting. And I think that just sets the tone for 2024. Some uh, see it as an opportunity to come in and squeeze value out of the system. Uh, some see it as an opportunity to in-country to retreat and hold back but then many see this as virgin territory where they can do really well. And that's really my, um, my counsel. Spend time 
with um, us. It's no one solution, no one fits all solution. Each corporate has a different situation. Their balance sheet structure is different. How they fund themselves are different. We really just have to spend the time with you. There is no um, quick fix. I, I can't remember who said, I think it was Chike said, we wake up thinking about the customers. Actually, I don't even think we sleep thinking about the customers. Because, and I, let me use yesterday as an example. The CEO sent me something. I looked at it, it was like 1.30 in the morning. And then I, I woke up and he had sent something at 5.34, whatever, in the morning. So I thought to myself, this is really dangerous territory. He's now telling us we have four hours every night to... So again, I think it's really the focus on the clients. And for many of you clients that are here, you've given us feedback. We've moved on from just being a banker. We've moved, and we use this, and we've used it for many years. The aim is to be a trusted business advisor. And so that's the, that's the, 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 the scale at which we play. We will continue to do that in 2024. Um, Again, it's really about advice and the support. And I feel all through all of the industries, oil and gas exports has been mature, but non-oil exports has been interesting for us over the last couple of years. We have some specific goals and targets for 2024. We will spend the time with you. Um, you will see the value. And so I just encourage us um, to, to pursue with First Bank. Thank you, Chicken. Thank you so much, Tosin. Again, what Tosin is trying to say is that if you're into any related export business or you are planning to go into, expand into exports, First Bank has built the capabilities, has allocated the funding, especially has also built the required expertise to give you the right support. Um, whether you are trying to enter into new markets or whether you want to expand the product offerings, First Bank is there for you and all the way they will support you to grow and support you to expand your businesses. Thank you. But Majid, I'll come, I'll turn to you right away. Um, in Dr. Adedipe's presentation, he did recap that we have about 1.32 trillion naira budgeted in the 2024 Appropriation Act. That's huge. Um, based on the work you've been doing, what are the opportunities you see for businesses who are in either related or in, within the infrastructure? And those infrastructure will be focused on water, health, and road, uh, road, 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 road transport. How do you advise businesses that either in those subsectors or intending to go into those areas, what should they be doing, given the huge amount that's been located? How do they take their pie and also support the economy? Thank you very much, Jude. Thank you, Chike. Thank you again for the extraordinary introduction you gave me. Uh, thank you, Jumoke, for being the only woman amongst all of us here, and to all the other women that are here, and of course the men. I, with, with reference to Nigeria's infrastructure, and the over one trillion naira that is in the budget this year for the infrastructure, infrastructure development, the first question we need to ask ourselves is, why? Why? And just for one minute, I'd like everyone here to picture a pregnant woman walking into a hospital. Just for one minute. Just imagine a pregnant woman walking into a hospital. The point I'm trying to make here is, based on the evidence we have in Nigeria today, every minute, 15 babies are born. You heard me right. Every minute, 15 babies are born. In simple terms, in today's Nigeria, 20,000 babies are born every day. You heard me right. Today's Nigeria, in 2024... 20,000 babies are born every day. 
I'll connect that to infrastructure in a bit, but I need you to understand what 20,000 babies every day means. On Sunday, um, Nigeria will be playing in the African Cup of Nations, and I would actually want everyone to watch that match. Um, it's going to be happening between Nigeria and Equatorial Guinea, Sunday, 3 p.m. That match will be happening at one of Cote d'Ivoire's largest stadium. They call it the Olympic Stadium. Um, it's called the Ebimpe Stadium in Cote d'Ivoire. It's a stadium that has the capacity to seat 60,000 people. The point I'm making is that between today and when Nigeria plays that match, the number of children that will have been born in Nigeria we will not have enough seats to have in that stadium. So that gives you an idea of the need. Between now and Sunday, Nigeria will have more babies to fill that stadium. And so, over the years, there's a need to provide infrastructure. Now, where are the opportunities? I would like to put the opportunities in three buckets. First is looking at what I've explained in the last one minute, food, shelter, clothing. Big bucket. Infrastructure. Second bucket, education. And in that second bucket as well includes security, crime. Because in that second bucket, because of the growing population, that second bucket is also the bucket that has poverty. It's the bucket that has out-of-school children. Clearly, we are seeing opportunities in the second bucket, and there are also challenges. The third bucket with respect to infrastructure is actually interesting. And that's because looking at the sort of population we've had, uh, and it's, it's population and infrastructure over the years has just been related uh, to the point where, you know, the Brits, they call Nigeria the fertility capital of the world now. Um, and clearly that's easy to under, uh, under explain. In 1960, when we gained independence, the population of our colonial masters then was 52 million. Nigeria, 45 million. So their population, the population of the United Kingdom, was significantly more than Nigeria. The population of the United Kingdom has grown from 52 million to what it is today, 67 million. Just a 17 million population growth. Nigeria's population has moved from 45 million to 216 million. So currently, we are three times the size of the United Kingdom. Clearly, there's an infrastructure challenge that creates opportunities. And in that third bucket is where the infrastructure for religion comes in. And that is the reason why we are seeing a lot of religious infrastructures growing. So yes, we talked about that. I've talked about the first bucket of uh, based on the infrastructure expenditure program of the government, opportunities for business largely will be in food, clothing, and shelter. Opportunities for businesses as well based on the infrastructure development programs of the government and based on our realities creates infrastructure needs in education, which the government needs to do, and also opportunities for the private sector. And clearly, based on what we are seeing, it also shows that for this year and the years to come, we're going to be seeing a lot more investments in religious infrastructure. So we're seeing government infrastructure, private sector infrastructure, and religious infrastructure. That is the outlook for infrastructure for 2024. Thank you so much, Babajide, and, and, that, and that's quite uh, insightful. Tosi, I'll come back to you, but before I come to you... Um, Dr. Dedigwe, do you have additional thoughts on what business opportunities are there for companies or businesses that may want to tap into the 1.32 trillion budget? Thank you so very much, uh, Chike. I will add to what Dede said on infrastructure. 
Because when he was speaking, my mind was playing around how this had been dealt with, talking to a major cement manufacturing company, talking to a major construction company, maybe the leaders in those sectors, and also several other players. And so the way it goes is this. If government intends to deliver infrastructure this much value, what specifics? And that means each customer affairs by here and every attendee of this particular event should look in the appropriation bill. It's a large document, about 2,590 pages there about. Okay? But when you look at it, you find some specifics that connect to what your business does. I mean, we've done this for insurance, you know, underwriters, and several sectors of the economy. So when you look at that, the question is, I can pull out from that bill the aggregate number in that particular budget relating to my own business. So the question there would be, what do I need to do in order to get a percentage of this? Same thing applies, I mean, we've done this for a major paint manufacturing company as well. So that is the way to deal with the budget. So now, if you don't do business directly with the government, they will now say, okay, if they will spend this money, where will it go? And then, how does my business connect with those, this money should go to directly? In fact, that's the way it applies to First Bank. Let me just bring it home. All right? Government will spend, this money should go to these places. I don't need to wait as a banker for the money to get there. What I will do is to begin right now to cultivate relationships with the entities that will receive those monies when there is now cash backing for those provisions in the budget. So the way it then goes is that if more money is going to this sector, what can I do there? And of course, it means also you have to look at your own business. And there's something I wrote down here, cost profiling. But that becomes very important in the environment we are. Look at the profile of your cost and then if there's any black box in your cost profile, that means you need to find a way of dismantling the black box, which means get a good understanding of every cost element. Then ensure that every cost element is productive. In which case, whatever your company is spending connects to the business you want to get either to get the business today or prepare you to get the business tomorrow. Any spending that doesn't do any of those two is unproductive. So that helps you now connect to whatever those opportunities are saying. And like those also said earlier, of building capabilities. And that is especially if you are looking at export, non-export opportunities. It may be a field you never thought about before. But if there are opportunities in there, why won't you want to explore that as well? I was a part of a conversation at First Bank here also a couple of months ago where we now talking about, look, if there's an environment where supply of FX is a major challenge, why don't you consider going to non export and then thereby you generate FX and therefore at least get some portion of what you normally would need to drive your core business? And that is what I see as the connection here. The idea is to see those opportunities. And there are so many, so many. We can still talk about them much later. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, Doctor. Um, uh, okay, Baba you want to... Yes, I just want to quickly add more? something to what um, Doctor said. And that's, when did the government make um, those huge numbers, 1.3 trillion now for infrastructure spending? Most times, is the... Businesses outside of Nigeria that smile more than the businesses in Nigeria. Because just as Doctor mentioned earlier, we are not manufacturing. So what is happening is the businesses in Nigeria really just act as a thoroughfare. That money is going into infrastructure spending, but those materials, those infrastructures are not being manufactured here. And so that money goes out, and the businesses here really just earn that service margin and perhaps margins for, for labor. So those big numbers make more people outside Nigeria smile than, than Nigerians. Thank you so much, Babajida. And that's why we need to develop local capacity 
to ensure that some of the raw materials coming from Nigeria. And that's why at First Bank, there's an infrastructure team, a team of experts that support businesses within the infrastructure space. And they are always there for you, um, giving you both novel and everyday type of advice, also providing funding support when required. So that's why our customers um, will always benefit when they talk to the infrastructure team of First Bank within the corporate banking group. Tosi, I'll come back to you. When Jumoke was speaking, she did mention that um, there are a couple of re reforms coming from the government that is focused on SMEs. Again, this underscores the importance of SMEs in catalyzing economic development in any economy or society. Would you let our audience know specifically what First Bank is doing to support SMEs? And, and if there are specific offerings or products that First Bank has designed to ensure that SMEs meet their revenue asp uh, aspiration and ensure that they are, they, are, they are sustainable businesses as we go on. Thank you, Tosin. Thank you, Chiki. There are just so many products focused on SMEs. Just before I jump onto that, Demala is the head of the infrastructure team. Demala, can you just raise your hand so people can see you? So we have an infrastructure group within corporate banking. Uh, we're expanding that team also, and Demala, Demala leads that team. SMEs, actually, I've, I've come into a new knowledge around SMEs, and SMEs uh, have become very agile and very focused on exports. And believe it or not, um, SMEs in all shapes and forms are um, moving stuff into the U.S., moving stuff into Europe. They're moving absolutely everything. There are people abroad whose wardrobes are constructed in Nigeria today. Tailors are shipping stuff out to Europe and the U.S. and wherever. Cooked food. There's cooked food being freighted out of Lagos on a daily basis in quantity. So families sit in London today and their cuisine is essentially cuisine that comes through from um, Lagos. If you're on Instagram, you can see all sorts of videos of what people are doing, which means clearly they have to understand logistics. They have to understand credit and credit control. Because then again, you need to make sure you get the dollars and the sterling either before and if you're giving credit, you need to understand how you profile clients. So SMEs need a bit of hand-holding. And, and by the way, good SMEs are only SMEs for a while. And also in my personal capacity, I think we had this last year and I gave an example of some guy who does some work for me and suddenly... I just discovered that I became his mentor, okay? And now he's grown to be a big millionaire. I keep teasing him like chairman because he has now become a chairman in his own right. And so they grow very quickly. And often what we also discover is because they are not equipped in terms of running the systems, they grow very quickly and then they burn and crash because something happens. There's no risk management. So you just discover that then they, they lose everything. And this is where we step into it. They're products designed to handhold. Actually, Sheyi, maybe I should just let Sheyi, Sheyi comment. Um, Sheyi Oifesa is the ED retail. Let's, let's let Sheyi comment on SMEs. He'll probably do a much better job than I will. Thank you. Thank you, Tosi. I, I think um, it's clear to all of us that the, the biggest chunk that can grow an economy like ours is a retail and the SME segment. And that's where probably that's where First Bank as a bank is focused on growing the SMEs, empowering them, providing finance so that that segment of the market can thrive. Um, across our network, you can get support if you are an SME. It's um, uh, from Lagos to Kano to Kano to, to Aba, you always get support. And where, it's, where that is important is because you see that the SMEs feed the, the large corporates, the multinationals, either in terms of the distribution of their products or in terms of supply of inputs. So they become very important. Yes, they are small in terms of um, their output, the volumes, but you see that these many people 
they 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 they, they play lots in employing people in our economy. So so that makes them very important. We are particularly focused on SMEs. I'm sure we have a very large bouquet of products that speaks to I can't imagine what you do as an SME really that there's no product in first bank for. I'm sure it's not been invented yet. Wait until we invent it ourselves. And that way I can assure you you get support. And it's a two way thing. From the SMEs to the multinationals, from the multinationals to the SMEs who eventually feed the households who are probably the consumers. So it, it's a deliberate play. Now, you talk about exports. They are there. They are the ones who we source for the little materials that the, the, the exporters will aggregate. Everywhere you turn, you'll find them. And I'm sure you can't get a better partner than First Bank. Walk into any First Bank branch. I'm sure your interest is well taken care of. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shi. Um, again, First Bank is synonymous with supporting SMEs to grow. Um, there are excellent offerings across sectors, across the value chain of the SMEs focus areas. Jumaka, I will turn to you right away. You, um, if you recall, there's been a growing climate change within the global as well as the domestic area. We've seen major interest in green energy and energy efficiency. Based on the work that your team is doing, um, what are the opportunities for businesses that want to get into green energy or energy efficiency area? And how is government specifically supporting them? Thank you, Tim. Okay. Well, I'm not in the Ministry of Environment. I'll just give that, that caveat. And I wasn't at COP before anybody asked me that. <laughs> <laughs> I would just say that as a systemic intervention, we work on about six priority areas. And the reason we chose those six priority areas coming from um, the last seven years is because we follow the places where Nigerian youth are disproportionately active. So we do a lot of reforms targeted at the tech sector, the creative sector, light manufacturing, um, decentralized power, um, transport and logistics. Generally, the reforms we work on are their pull rather than push. It's where the demand comes from. Um, I think it was the GMD that was talking about being active in the associations where stakeholders and customers are in. When the policy push comes from the private sector, it's always a lot more st stronger for a project office like the PEBEC Secretariat. We sometimes scope what's going on in social media and just the pulse of, of private sector, particularly younger private sector because we focus on MSMEs. And why MSMEs? You're both speaking to that right now. Over 90% of jobs, I think about 87% of jobs in Nigeria are generated by MSMEs. MSMEs are just under 50% of the GDP of Nigeria. Um, in terms of registered businesses, well over 90% of businesses registered at the CAC are MSMEs. So we go with, yes, everybody has recently been talking about climate change, and that's a sector that's also moving very aggressively. But we move with the economy, we move with the pulse, and we move with where MSMEs are going to have a lot of benefit, which is also why we're now actively supporting medium and larger sized enterprises just for what Shay said just now about the aggregation and the osmosis that goes on. So the policies are agnostic almost. We seek to support every sector, particularly those sectors that have peculiar challenges and make those demands and make those feedback known to the, private, to the public sector. Thank you so much, Jumoke. Uh, and and Tosin, following from there, uh, we've seen the need for energy efficiency, greener energy, or less climate destructive energy focus. Based on that, we, gas is receiving significant interest, both from local and international investors. 
as um, the director in charge of corporate businesses who are also developing interest in this, are there specific things First Bank is offering to both potential and existing investors and operators within the gas environment to, to enable them increase their operations as well as make more money? Thank you, Tosi. Okay, thank you, Chike. It looks like you don't want us to go home. It's talking about gas. There's just so much focus on gas. Actually, a little bit of a disappointment at the beginning of last year. We tooled, we tooled up for gas, and uh, we didn't see the pipeline of projects, actually. Um, we have seen one or two, but not, not the quantum. And I think it's probably the whole macro, macro overdrop that kind of dampened things a little bit. But clearly, being a cleaner fuel, um, it's only a matter of time. Uh, so we have um, a specific team. Um, Temi Tayo, are you here? Um, we have a specific team focused on, on gas. We continue to look at gas projects. The beauty of the value chain with gas is such that actually you can have some mid-sized opportunities and alongside you can have some major-sized opportunities also. All of them come with a requirement for financing, non-conventional financing. So it's not just just give a loan and then expect it to be paid in two years. A lot of it requires access to international markets again, so you need a bank that clearly can help you export credit. All of these um, structures require experience and, and knowledge, which I think is where you would find First Bank play in. Historically, people have treated these like a box standard conventional loan. And what has happened is clearly things haven't gone according to plan. Actually, they never do in that manner. Um, and then the projects have run into trouble. Uh, so there's no substitute for doing it properly and doing it well. Um, requires significant planning. We have a client who has some gas projects, um, and he's been planning for about two and a half to three years. So it just tells you that the homework is significant. And you need a bank that clearly has a long-term view um, is able to put balance sheet behind it, but also has the credibility and the pedigree to attract other institutions that ultimately will support you along that journey. Okay, infra credit, AFs, whoever it is. So it's a space where we're very active. It's a space where we understand, you know, and have the, the resources to deploy. And I, I certainly look forward to a lot more gas projects, Chike, because I think it's a major growth area, not just for First Bank, but just for the country in, in general. So summary, we're hearing a lot of noise about it, but we're not seeing that translate into projects. We think that will change this year. Uh, we continue to remain um, optimistic. Any of those kind of projects, please have a discussion with us on the corporate or commercial banking side, also on the investment banking side. That's extremely relevant to these type of products. Um, so let's, let's leave it there. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let me chip in a bit about, about gas, and, and those are much larger projects, but speaking to the economy and even when people talk about transitions in government and things like that, and maybe that's probably part of why, because these are huge investments, so they do slow down when there's, economic, when there's political transitions. But Nigeria completed NLNG Change 7 in the middle of COVID-19, fully subscribed um, had been, they've been working on that transaction for years and trying to get it done. But just to see that when creative financing comes into it, my, my husband is currently finance director of Snepco, but he was working with NLNG from Shell on that Train 7 transaction. When creative credit solutions come to the table, this Nigerian economy continues to deliver significant reforms for global markets and for Nigerian businesses. Thank you for that, Jumaka. And we, we were part of NLNG, actually. And, <laughs> and I, I missed the points which I should have raised. We were, we were part of NLNG through the bank here, through our bank in London also, where a lot of the expertise resides around mining. We haven't spoken about mining today. These, these are major areas of growth for the country. Uh, and the potential to clearly change the Nigerian dynamic is significant. We can spend the next few hours just talking about mining. At First Bank has done a lot more work, in my opinion, than any other bank uh, around mining and the mining opportunities and are putting action points against it. So um, 
Now, when you look at a country like DRC, and you will have to stop me because I will, I will continue to drift. We have the third largest bank in DRC. Again, if you understand DRC, DRC is about really mining. And so this is expertise that we have built, that we understand, and clearly rearing, rearing to go. So coverage teams across London, across Lagos, any gas projects, uh, we are definitely interested. We have the patience and the understanding of, the, of that business to, to bring value. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tosin. And um, for stakeholders within the gas environment or even potential stakeholders, First Bank um, understands the ecosystem and all the partners that can play. So operators who, who come to First Bank have the advantage of getting connected to different stakeholders that can make things happen. That's what Tosin is trying to say. Tosin, is that correct? Excellent. I'll come to you, Babajide. Um, one of the things that has been mentioned here when Dr. Adedikwe presented is around increasing urbanization in Nigeria. In 2015, we were in the 47% urbanization. Today, we are hitting the 50s. Again, businesses, especially service-based businesses, are looking for opportunities. How would you see this trend which we see they may continue pretend opportunities for service-based businesses to solve the, the, the likely crisis or challenges that will come from that area. Because in every challenge, there's an opportunity. May you just share with the customers what they should be looking out for or what, what they should be doing. Thank you. Thank you, Chike. With reference to urbanization, there's some good news and there's bad news. Now, the good news is when we look at the quantity side of urbanization, which he has explained, um, we see that happening quickly, quantity. The bad news is when we look at the quality of urbanization, and I would want you to listen carefully to what I want to explain about the quality of urbanization. Only last month, the, the World Bank released the new estimate of um, the world's GDP per capita, um, country by country on a purchasing power parity basis. Within that report, it showed that at the start of the millennium, 2001, Nigeria's GDP per capita was approximately $3,000. In the last two decades, we've gone from only $3,000 to $5,000. What the World Bank was trying to show is that based on our slow trend of growth, we most likely will not get to that prestigious mark of $10,000 until 2070. So imagine Nigeria's GDP per capita of $10,000 in 2070. Where will you be? But that's not the bad news. The bad news is the United States had gotten to 10,000 GDP per capita in 1975. So where Nigeria will be in 2070 per capita, how the quality of life, if we were to use that as a proxy, is where the U.S. was in 1975. So what we are saying is, yes, we are urbanizing, but what sort of quality are the people having? What's the quality of life of those that are urbanizing? That's the point. So yes, we're urbanizing, but what sort of life are those that are urbanizing having? Where clear challenges that also show opportunities for the bank what is clear is the quality of your customer profiling. We're at an era where the cost quality of your customer profiling is getting more important than the quality of your credit. The quality and how, how detailed you analyze consumers is perhaps getting more important than the quality of your loan book. For Nigerians, um, it clearly means that the opportunities in the short, medium, and long term, will still majority of those opportunities will still be at the bottom of the ladder, which is what currently what the National Bureau of Statistics even shows, whereby 
more than half of what people spend their money on still remains food. So food, when we talk about opportunities, will still be where majority of the opportunities will be. On further opportunities, yes, um, based on how the Bureau of Statistics categorizes economic sectors in Nigeria, which is also another way to say a categorization for economic opportunities and economic challenges. There are 45 sectors in the country that shows and points to everyone. Whatever business you want to do still largely is within those 45 economic sectors. However, six of these, five of these sectors account for 65% of everything that happens in the country. So food and clearly these five sectors will be where the opportunities will be in the short, medium, and long term. And so, yes, GK, in terms of quantity, we are seeing urbanization. But in terms of the quality of urbanization in the short, medium, to the long term, we do not see quality urbanization unless um, something beyond a miracle happens. Thank you so much. Doctor, do you want to make some input? Uh, some addition to that. Now, when there is rapid urbanization and uh, Nigeria happens to be among the top 10 in the world in terms of the speed of urbanization, for obvious reasons too, climate change, security challenges, you know, especially in the north, is making a lot more people come to the south. That's one. Lagos in particular is attractive in the sense that there is data to show how many people come into Lagos every one hour without an intention to return to where they came from. All right? And that means Lagos' population is increasing by the hour. Now, what does this mean? Anywhere you go in the world, once you talk about urbanization, the first thing that ticks up, like Dide said, is food, because they must eat. The second thing that comes big is energy. And that's the connection between the last two issues you raised. All right? Consumption of power also ticks up. Because the lifestyle in the urban center is totally different from the rural center. So when they come to the urban center, they begin to be exposed to gadgets and devices that are driven by electricity. And so that brings a demand for power as well. So in which case, if that is accepted to be the pattern, which is proven by data anyway, that means there are opportunities for customers of First Bank and anyone here to look at that space as well. And then connect that to energy transition, which of course, when you get to that field as well, a whole lot of things are happening within that space. So how can I put a foothold within the value chains of energy transmission? And there's a lot of opportunities in there as well. Of course, when we talk about agriculture, which is the major contributor to our GDP, by the way, people often think agriculture is about going to the farm. It's not so. The idea simply is look at the value chain for every agricultural produce. So where can I play there? Let me just drop one, then I will stop. Ordinary warehousing can be all you will do within that value chain. And of course, I know someone that we had a conversation about this time last year, and the fellow said, when I looked at that, I simply told myself that this opportunity I can take advantage of. So he went to one of his bankers, and he constructed 30 large warehouses along this Lagos by the expressway. And he said within the space of three months, 26 of them were leased out. And the 26, in terms of the income from it, was enough to extinguish the money borrowed from the bank. And then he now looked at it and said, so, I think I need to return to my bankers, take more money and build more warehouses. Now, the whole idea simply is that those warehouses were taken up by operators in the FMCG. And so for them, it was a period of storing their own raw materials, likely grains, 
So they needed the warehouses. So he was not playing directly in agriculture, but providing infrastructure that supports the value chain. So that's just to give you an idea of opportunities that exist in diverse forms. So the more people come to urban areas, the more, of course, the pressure of feeding them. In which case, where can I connect within that space? So that's what I thought I should mention here. Thank you so much, Doctor. And that brings us to the end of the panel session. We will take the move into the Q and A session. So we'll give opportunities to both our in-person participants as well as our online participants. So questions. I will start with <clears throat> with the online question. We have a question here. Doctor is for you. Um, it says, given that manufacturing is very central to the growth of the Nigerian economy, and we're experiencing the exit of some big manufacturing firms, how would you advise the government to ensure that we have either new manufacturers coming in or local participants um, starting up to also bridge that gap? Thank you. Very, very good question. But we need to put it in perspective. When you look at the big manufacturers, quote and unquote, that are exiting, it's not about Nigeria. They are simply implementing their global strategy. And in actual fact, if we take GSK, for example, it's part of their global strategy they started implementing in 2013. This makes it now 11 years ago. All right? And, of course, the whole idea for them is to harmonize their manufacturing activities, produce in few places, and now export to those countries where they were manufacturing before. So it's strictly their own business strategy they were executing. If you take P&G, the same thing. Because it's not only Nigeria. So to put that in perspective. Now, the reality, and that's my answer to your question now directly, is that one key thing manufacturers look out for, we already have it. Now, we may say so much about poverty in Nigeria, capacity to buy, but the reality is that Nigeria still stands out as a market most manufacturers are aiming to sell to. Either manufacture where they are, export to Nigeria, or come here to produce here and sell. Now, one thing that we saw when we began with FSS 2020, I was privileged to be in that team, because be a consult handle the credit market team. The projection then by the World Bank, and it's just around the corner now, is that by year 2025, if you're a manufacturer, a business anywhere in the world, and you have no Nigerian strategy, you are unlikely to be competitive globally beyond that period. And what does it mean about having a Nigerian strategy? Either you are here in Nigeria producing, or wherever you are in the world, your business is connected to Nigeria. All right? So now, when you see most of these players that are producing outside, they are still eyeing Nigeria as a market to sell to. So in which case, as the person said, what would be my advice to the government? Part of it is what Jumoke is doing. Excellent job. And that is reform that makes the business environment more conducive. Then the second part now is you might also mention that, and I've advocated for this for many years. Now, governments should not sit back in their own office, but go after proven players and manufacturers in sectors of interest and go after them. Because we've seen some countries do that. In the last three months, I've received people in my office from Japan that they said their embassy here in Nigeria referred to my office. Because that company wants to establish a business in Nigeria. I've seen people from Germany that's talking about the last three months. Up to five different countries with inquiries. So quick means there's something attractive about this market. That will make the, Switzerland is one of them, okay? That makes them want to come here. But the question I ask myself is what do they see that we don't see? And that's my challenge here. To even ourselves sitting in this hall and those on the virtual platform. So the, ch the challenge to government is to make the environment more conducive, go after those major players who want here, 
and ask them, what do you need? I can say this for free because it's open knowledge. Ghanaian government did this to innocent in 2011. And what we did was to now in turn ask him. It was a brief window of three months I spent in the government as an advisor to the president then. And we said, tell us, what do you need to remain here in Nigeria? Instead of going to Ghana with this attractive offer they gave you. And the man said, either low interest rate, oh sorry, I can't influence that. How about government patronage? We said, yes, we can do that. So those are the kind of things that our government should do to make manufacturers come and to make manufacturers remain. But on the other hand, we ourselves should also look beyond that and focus more on opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. And that was quite insightful. Uh, please, if you have questions from the audience, we are ready to take that to any of the panelists. We also expect more questions from our online audience. Um, we take one or two questions from the in-person audience. Please, can somebody pass the mic? Take. Good morning. My name is Fiona Ahimi. I manage the stockbroking business for the First Bank Group. Doctor, I like your mention on the capital market. The returns for 2023 was 45%. So far, year today is about 11%. Now, however, if you look at the GDP of the capital market, GDP, capital market to the GDP is about 18%. South Africa is about 341%. What, in your view, do you think are the very low hanging fruits? that the government needs to put in place to help bolster the activities in the market, that's one. The CBN governor has also, is clamoring for capitalization of banks in Nigeria. What do you think um, this is going to do in terms of impacting the capital markets and also investors? Then also for our clients, what opportunities do you see available in the capital markets for them? Thank you. So we take Additional two questions. Um, doctor, please hold it there. Um, thank, you. <clears throat> thank you very much. My name is Olawale Ajay. I'm from Lagos Business School. Uh, but permit me, first of all, of course, to uh, recognize and give kudos to First Bank, who have always supported uh, the Lagos Business School in very many ways, particularly the Breakfast Club, which I <clears throat> compare. Uh, I actually want to uh, ask uh, one question and maybe make uh, one or two comments. And uh, I want to point out to Babaji De Ogunsonwu, who is one of our experts from Lagos Business School, uh, who is doing great things. The last time we met was at Channels, and I told you how the Supreme Court was going to decide the matter. And I think it worked out exactly that way. And this was uh, right when the presidential elections were being announced. Well, okay, uh, I think, uh, doctor, the, 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 I'm curious about um, how this credit uh, strategy, consumer credit strategy, is going to work out. Obviously, um, consumer credit is necessary for providing that purchasing. Uh, of course, in, an, in a high interest uh, zone, that seems to be problematic. But you, you also know that consumer credit is always very high in every economy. It's the, the poor pay more. So I'm not too sure of, uh, that, that the issue is what items are really going to um, be uh, advanced. This, but the point really is I don't see the banks as being the ones to do, do consumer credit. And our finance industry, so we need new players across all chains, including, you know, f factors and so on and so forth. Uh, and I know CBN had been trying to work on this, uh, but uh, so that's an area of infrastructure that uh, I'm curious to see how is it really going to work. The banks should probably be in wholesale financing. Uh, the other point, of course, is uh, probably related to uh, Jumoke, who very interestingly said she's not quite connected to green, uh, green energy. And, and I think uh, that's one area where government really must align. 
because the truth of the matter is that sustainability must become key and must be mainstream and integrated into all sectors. Um, and I think the issue really is uh, a, a cluster-based strategy. And um, First Bank, uh, what do you do in terms of supply chain financing? Is that an area in which you are playing? Or is that an area in which you are going to play? Because I think with supply chain financing, cluster-based uh, uh, industrial organization, uh, even the special agro, uh, industrial agro, uh, 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 what's it now, agro zones that uh, AFDB is support, supporting, we do need the bankers to be more than investment, uh, more than advisors. I think we do need the bankers to be actually facilitators because we must be able to join the players uh, all across uh, the value chain. So it will be also interesting to see what, uh, I mean, to hear what uh, your, 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 your thoughts are. And I think that's the way you can finance end to end and actually ensure that the private sector uh, drives growth. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll take one last question before we respond. So um, we will take additional questions. Um, you can send it to the to the email provided. One day we can give you responses post the event, please, uh, so that we can manage time. Go ahead. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Sukomi Oweyemi. So my question is around prospects and the current opportunities. So in the country now, there is so much prospects, but how do we plan to actualize this. So for me, I play in the cocoa exporting industry. I export cocoa around 40,000 tons out of Nigeria every year. Soya, around 30,000 tons. The roofing industry, we are also there. We import coil and oil. Also in the oil and gas space, we play a bit. But the issues with the prospects we have and with the bank financing we get, I see challenges around protecting local industries. And when I say this, when we compete with multinationals in the bush that, and they export the same produce we export at the same taxation level, if I'm to buy a house in London, I'm going to pay non-resident tax. That gives edge to the people, the UK residents, and in any civilized Western world, there is a protection to local industry. So if we, even in the roofing industry, you import coil from multinationals there, they come to Nigeria also, bring those products, ship load more than what Nigerians can afford. Cheaper, they, they, they produced it, bring a ship load. So at that point, the prospect leads to a whole lot of loss. The, pros, the Nigerian prospects lose a lot of money in this process in a way whereby bank give financing. It's not always mismanagement that kills Nigerian businesses. It's the unhealthy competition and lack of protection. No one says multinationals should not come, but they already have a edge if you are producing. You have a edge if you are in the commodities market, you are a final end user. There is a value chain in cocoa. There is the, I'll just say a bit, so the processor, from the processor, there's the trade houses. From the trade houses, there's the exporter, which I sit on. From the exporters, there's the regional merchants. From the regional merchants, there's the local buying agents. From the local buying agents, there's the brokers. From the brokers, there are the farmers. So as an exporter, if I go to the farmers, then I'm making people lose their jobs. I'm making it unattractive because my financing capacity, the brokers don't have it. So they lose the appetite to remain in the farm. And this is what causes a whole lot of urbanization that don't make sense where people ride bike, do Uber, when they can be much more productive in the farm. So if a multinational goes to the farm and a younger person of my age is in the farm, it will live there because of the unhealthy competition. Me, I'm able to stay in the business because I worked with my dad before I started my own business. By God's grace, I'm these are the challenges people face. How do we plan to protect the people just going into the farm? So much prospect, 
they get money, but not the credit is even still an issue. Credit is the bedrock to any prosperity. Even the Western world today, they still pay a whole lot in mortgages, 20, 30 years. So even credit and policies, how can we give not the big companies? If we give the uh, even the young graduates credit, a whole lot of commodities will grow in the bush and they would have money to buy inputs and do a whole lot. So the policies to protect the local industry is my question. How do we plan to protect the local industry? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for that question. Very, very kind question. Jumoke, I will allow you to respond to the policy um, area. Why Tosi and potentially supported by Mobalade um, can respond to the bank support or credit related area. Thank, thank you, Jumoke. You. Thank you. Just to say that sustainability, before I go on to this, is extremely important. It's just not, how should I say, the PEBEC works on a systemic intervention for business climate reforms. So there are other people within the government, which is why it's a team effort that puts sustainability into everything they do. I wouldn't want this audience to leave with an impression that the PEBEC doesn't care about green energy or sustainability or that the government as a whole is ignoring that very important um, aspect of governance and future, future prospects. Just to say that that is not my personal portfolio, but there are a lot of people working on that. I agree completely with what you've said. I wouldn't call it protection. I would call it enablement, because there's a difference. We've worked with manufacturing associations, we worked with private, organized private sector. I'm making the point, if you, if you cast your mind back to the Nigerian experience with AFCFTA, and Nigeria signing that agreement and joining that agreement, there was a mismatch with private sector and government aligning, and it cost Nigeria quite a bit in terms of signing the agreement, in terms of getting the secretariat domiciled in Nigeria, and a lot of other multiplier um, implications or consequences to just not getting the feedback and the lobbying right. I think that Nigerian manufacturers, um, farmers have challenges but are able to compete with support of government. So basically it's a partnership. That's why communication is important. You've spoken about access to credit. The role of government in speaking with financial institutions to see what products can be made available for the private sector is an important communication um, ecosystem with the central bank, with big banks, with microcredit, with uh, Bank of Agriculture, with Bank of Industry, with big players articulating what exactly the problems are, how have these been worked on in other climates, and what exactly should we do, what goals should we set. That's part of the work of the Pebec Business Champions Program that I talked about earlier, and it's been happening. Sometimes there's also a mismatch with what organized private sector is asking government for, when you, we use words like protection or um, we try to be protectionist, it also doesn't help the market because um, it took Nigerian private sector a long time to agree to the AFCFTA agreement. And I think that it was costly for the agreement. It was costly for Nigeria and costly for the economy. Rather, we should look at how we can enable private sector to take full advantage because Nigerian businesses are able to dominate the African continent, the regional economy, and you talk about cocoa, there's shea, there's sesame, there's so many products, there's yam, there's cassava, that Nigeria, all the non-oil exports, the research is there, the players are there, but if you had even asked me about the business environment, if you'd asked me about what we're doing with customs, what we're doing with uh, immigration, all those challenges, I'm sure you have um, first-hand experience, and still trying to walk through those, those are all the soft areas that still need a lot of attention. Cold chain storage, we talked about so many things here. The work is enormous, but where I would leave us with is that it's a collaboration. When we continue to speak and we continue to target specific adjustments to policies and um, even with the private sector, because we're here dealing with, with the bank and, and banking stakeholders, how we even address the credit issues, how we address the policy issues, we delineate everything and prioritize and say what are businesses like yours going to commit 
to also your ecosystem. And I'm glad that you, you identified the entire chain because if we don't have all those MSMEs um, clustered around the bigger players, having a fair um, environment, then we have a lot of more of insecurity. We have a lot more of um, unemployment. We have a lot more. So the issues are definitely there. And they're not one that any one player can solve alone. But with innovation and creative thinking, I am very bullish and hopeful about the direction for the Nigerian economy in 2024. Thank you so much, Jumoke. So in 60 seconds, please just respond to the how First Bank is supporting or will support um, those businesses with credit. Sure. Sukumi is very modest. We should actually clap for him. He's the eighth largest non-oil exporter in Nigeria. His, his business is doing fabulously well, but he keeps pushing, and I guess, I guess that's what makes him a, a great, great company. Supply, sorry, and I know we've run out of time. Consumer credit is actually very important to banks. It's very important to us. Um, a lot of work going on within First Bank around consumer credit. Telcos who are lending have their back engine in First Bank. Again, we can come back to that at some point, um, sir. Supply chain. Obalade, please comment on supply chain. That's your, your business. Please, can we give him a microphone quickly? So I, I think the Prof asked a question um, around um, our ability to support clients with supply chain financing uh, solutions. And that's actually an area we focus a lot on. So if we our approach and the way we've looked at businesses is to look at the entire ecosystem which means that we can look at their working capital and sort of de-risk it in a way that is more efficient for them. So um, it's a process that we're actually working through a digital journey. So uh, there's a first direct 2.0 platform that we have that enables our clients and um, their suppliers within that ecosystem for us to be able to just uh, walk through their supply chain financing needs. So it's actually an area that we spent a lot of time because we see the value that it creates uh, for our clients. Uh, and we can sort of catch up and I'll share more details uh, with you, Prof. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mobilade. Again, I did mention that First Bank looks at an ecosystem perspective when supporting customers. So and supply chain is at the heart of that. Um, I, I would like you to spend uh, just two minutes responding to some of the questions uh, related to your presentation. Okay, thank because you. Because we are running out of time. Yes, it's on the capital market. Two basic things that can make the capital market to grow relative to the GDP, as you observe in other countries around the world. Number one is tax incentives. That means whatever returns people make from investing in that market, there should be some kind of tax you know, uh, support to incentivize that. The second thing is market integrity. Where there is integrity in your capital market, investors will come. So once you're able to assure that and leadership for that starts for the, regula the APEX regulatory body, and that is SEC, then the SRO in there, NGX, and of course any other such platforms. Now on the second issue the, that you raised, and that's relating to recapitalization. Now, what we expect from CBN is to come out clear in terms of the period that will be done and then what they expect. Of course, we've done all manner of permutations to estimate where the new levels should be for international, of course, national and regional banks. Okay, but CBN needs to now come out clearly what the new threshold will be and then how much time they will give the banks to achieve that. That again will be, we rub off on the capital market anyway, as we have seen before. And the third issue you raised is capital market opportunities. The reality, as I said earlier on, looking at the Nigerian capital market in 2023, what has happened so far 2024, we then ask ourselves, how will that likely play out in the rest of the year? If most outlooks being done point to a positive growth for the economy this year, that means the flip side to that will be an expectation of a positive capital market. And if that is the case, it means there are opportunities in there to invest in stocks like Airbnb Holdings. 
I will leave it there. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much. Bajire, 30 yes. seconds. Yeah, if you want to make additional seconds. Something that's very heavy on my heart that you mentioned regarding the challenges of cocoa and crop. And I'd like to say one thing that, is, one, one thing, um, that should be very... that the government needs to take more seriously. Not all roads lead to heaven. Since independence, Nigeria has still not clearly articulated its growth model. Crop production today in Nigeria is not only Nigeria's largest economic sector, it is the sector that employs the most Nigerians, crop production. None of Nigeria's 45 sectors is as large as crop production. None of Nigeria's 45 sectors employs as many Nigerians as crop production. Now, looking at the numbers for this year, crop production in Nigeria in the first nine months is growing by as low as 1.65%. 1.65%, Nigeria's largest economic sector, growing by only 1.65%. The sector that employs most Nigerians, growing by only 1.65%. Yet, the government expects the economy to grow in excess of 3.7% this year. What has happened over the years is there hasn't been any clear path to Nigeria's growth and prosperity until... Leadership decides our road to heaven. Nothing is going to happen in crop production, and we'll keep moving at this pace. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, my panelists, Tosin, Jumoke, Dr. Adedekwe, and Baba Jide. Um, we've come to the end, and I will give Tosin permission to give us a, a closing remarks. Then we'll do photo ops. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Tosin, quick closing remarks. Okay, let's do photo ops before we get into the. So we'll take two minutes closing remarks from Tosin Thank you so much. All right. Um, on behalf of um, management of First Bank, we would like to thank you for your time. It's, for us, it's always a pleasure to engage with you at the beginning of the year like this so that we can all plan our journey towards a successful year. We thank you for your time for this breakfast meeting, and we hope that we'll see more of you, we'll have more engagement. I'm sure all those questions that have been sent, you'll get answers to them. We are always very committed and uh, coordinated about this event. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Shei. We still have light refreshments outside here. And thank you so much for coming. As you know, we love putting you first in everything we do. We've got the ATMs, so you don't have to walk into any banking hall. And if you want to deposit, you can too with the Telecash Recycler. We have a self-service kiosk available for your personal banking services like your statement request, 
card block, pin reset, and other requests. The self-service kiosk offers these various services for all your banking queries and needs. There is the card issuance machine for your new ATM card on the go with no hassles. For our trendy customers, we've got video banking available with ease you can sit and carry out all your banking needs. First Bank Digital Experience Center is innovative, automated and interactive. It's your one-stop banking solution to a fully digital banking experience. Step in and enjoy a world of possibilities. You first, first bank. Emergencies happen when you least expect them to. It gets worse when you are cash trapped. No need to despair. First Advance has you covered. You can get that urgent cash right now on First Advance. With First Advance, salary earners can get up to 50% of their salary. No hassles. As long as you earn a monthly salary and your salary account has been active for at least two months, just dial star 894 star 11 hash or simply dial star 894 hash on your mobile phone. What's more, when you open a First Bank salary account, you can enjoy zero charges and free debit card issuance. Download the First Mobile app on Play Store or App Store today. Log in to experience First Bank digital banking. Select Loans, select First Advance and follow the prompts to receive your loan. Don't let that urgent need get the best of you. Get First Advance now. It's as simple as dialing star 894 star 11 hash. First Advance. Fast, convenient, secure. You first. First Bank. Here's a card when no go give you stress at all. Zero weight and zero cue. Here's a card when no go give you a hala. Zero trouble now for you. Tell off the tea from Tell off the spoiler.